so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Welcome to Mamma Mia Out Loud. It's what women are actually talking about on Friday the 29th of September. I am Holly Wainwright. I am Mia Friedman. And I am Claire Stevens. We sound <laughs> weird know, we today. We all sound surprised sound about weird. who we are today. <laughs> <laughs> on today's show, everyone is talking about whether it's possible for a man to give a woman a compliment without it being creepy AF. Also, should the richest person at the table always pay the dinner bill? And we wrap up the week with our best and worst, as always, which include a stolen identity, a bloody sign of stress and a pedestrian echidna. But first, Mia Friedman. In case you missed it, guess what you can do with a carrot? No, it's not a rude thing. You can apparently give yourself a tan. There is a beauty trend going viral on TikTok. It's called the carrot tan and it involves eating carrots to get a natural glow. Now, this sounds like quite a safe way to get a tan because we know that the sun is not good. It's skin cells in trauma. That's what a tan is. But some people are using the carrot tan technique to do that. So it's kind of like cheaper than getting a spray tan, cheaper than maybe buying some self-tanner. In fact, one TikToker named Isabel has claimed that eating three carrots a day has given her her natural tan. Here's what she says three large carrots a day and you can change your natural undertone. This is literally the skin that I was born with. And this is me with no fake tanner. I have been eating three large carrots a day for the past few years. It changes everything. Trust me. Like literally you're going to glow from the inside out. Love ya. Well, look, podcasts on a visual medium. We can't show you what Isabel looks like, but she is quite tan. But, you know, there's not a scientific like, test. Is she orange tan? Like carrot coloured tan? Like or glowy. Like, like glowy oh, tan. Golden tan. Yeah. Oh. So she seems to be suggesting it's a glowy tan. Whereas I. I don't know what that means. Like, you wouldn't want to be the colour of a carrot, would you? No. A Donald Trump yeah. shirt. You'll be shocked to hear that there has been no research conducted on how many carrots are safe to eat. Because scientists are trying to cure cancer. Thank you very much. (laughs) But eating around three kilograms of carrots weekly is said to cause safe skin tone changes. Professor Lauren Bell and Dr. Emily Birch wrote an article for Mamma Mia about this, which we will link to in the show notes. Oh, my God. You did not just say that. How old are you? What are you, lawyer? Don't you think you're a little old to be using cheesy pickup lines? Everyone is talking about whether or not a man can give a woman a compliment. I need to add the words these days to the end of that sentence. And when I do that, we all know what these days is code for. It's code for in this wild, woke world we live in now. One such person is writer Christopher Bantick, whose column in the Sydney Morning Herald called Can You Give a Woman a Compliment on Her Appearance? Not Anymore, It Seems, has gone a little bit viral and lots of people are talking about it. He wrote, There was once a time you could give a woman on the street a compliment without it appearing to be an ulterior motive. For example, you look very smart. I think your dress is lovely. (laughs) He says that now if he's going to give a woman a compliment, he's learned to ask for permission. So he might say something like, would you mind if I told you that your hair looks nice? Like you've you've already given the compliment, mate. Like, Jesus. Which is somehow stranger indeed. And he asks, have we really become so timid and mindful of not wanting to cause offence that we have to lose out on the little fillip of self-esteem that can come from someone offering up a short sentence to put a spring in our step? I love this. Well, I want to tell you what another Herald writer wrote about this. Kerry Sackville, who's really funny writer, she wrote a reply with a suggested list of rules that were men cannot compliment a stranger, men cannot compliment a woman if there is any power imbalance at play, i.e. you're her boss, she's your boss, she's the barista in a cafe, etc., concluding women still like to be appreciated, but we just put feeling safe above all else. So I want to know from Claire Stevens first, if there's any circumstance where she thinks it's okay for a man who is not your husband, your brother, your father, to pay you a compliment and it's okay. Well, I think it's interesting that this entire uh, conversation is solely about compliments around women's appearance. So our friend Christopher 
was very upset because he said, I see women on the street and I have a thought and I don't know why I can't share that thought. How and that old is, is Christopher? oppressive to me. He is an older gentleman. Mm. I think we would probably classify it as a boomer. Yeah. And so he was basically saying, like, you know, I see a smart outfit. I want to tell her. My question for Christopher is, have you ever gone up to a man on the street and told him that you think his outfit is smart. Well, he can't answer that question for you, Claire, because he's not here. Well, I would say the answer would be no. And my response to that would be you wouldn't do that because that would be patronising and weird and you wouldn't go up to a man and say, I think your suit looks smart because a man is not an object for you to comment on while he's walking down the street, whereas Mm. a woman is. So I think the moral panic about this is ignoring the fact that women socially have always been valued more highly for how they look than anything else. And also we are used to being objects when we walk down the street. I want to know what Mia thinks. There's a scene in the Barbie movie where Barbie goes into the real world and she's walking down the street and she suddenly feels a thing that she can't identify. And I think she describes it as, I'm aware, but I'm aware of myself. (laughs) And basically she's describing what the male gaze feels like, what it's like to be looked at by men. And I don't think we should give Chris a hard time. Like I genuinely don't because I think that it's really easy to, particularly with boomers, and I even feel it as a Gen Xer, you've got to give people time to adjust to the fact that the world has changed. And I know I say this a lot, but 30 years ago when I was a waitress, Customers used to pinch my bum and that was just a thing that happened. A few years ago before that, people used to smoke in the office. That was a thing that happened. So our social and cultural standards and expectations have changed and that's a good thing. But for some people, they haven't understood why. And I think what Chris doesn't understand, and it's the same reason that men didn't understand why women don't like it when you'd say, oh, smile, this idea that I'm being looked at is kind of an intrusive one. Like I dress for myself. Some people do dress for that, but not everybody does. And I do always comment on women's appearances. Sorry, not their appearances, their clothes, because that's currency to me. And it's also someone's clothes is something that's not actually them. Mm -hmm. And because there was a choice made about I bought this, I decided to wear this today. I think it's a very neutral compliment. But when you compliment the way someone looks apart from that, or even just their outfit in the street, when you are someone of a different gender, it does feel different. And I wouldn't expect Chris to know that because he's a guy. I wouldn't expect so. I would like to understand when it is okay, right? So Claire, I think we're all on exactly the same page that strangers male strangers commenting on your appearance in Mm. the street is never welcome. I can't think of a time when I was like, oh, that's nice. But I want to stretch it a bit in terms of these rules. So I work with some men. So do you. We all work in the same place. Are they allowed to say nice dress, nice hair, like those shoes? No. So I would find that strange. Why? Because Mm. I'm not in the workplace to be looked at and judged on my appearance. But I'm what in the if workplace. I say it to you? What if I say nice dress, nice hair, nice shoes? I get a bit frustrated by that argument that a lot of people are like, well, why is it okay if you flip it? And it's like, because it's called the male gaze. Yeah. It's the male gaze. Women uh, don't have the male that. gaze. We all understand that. What you've just said and what Mia said about it is 100% true. And I, I agree with you. But why do we assume that a man who we work with who knows us well wants to say nice shirt, that it's somehow got an undertone of sexual power? Because when it's a woman, there is... Assuming she's straight. Assuming she's straight, but even if she's not, there's more of an affinity around, oh, nice shirt, I'm interested because where did you get it? Yes. And I'm interested because, oh, I quite like that for me type thing. It's like there's a connection there. Whereas when a man comes up to you, especially a man where there is power imbalance where there's an age difference whatever if a man comes up and says oh I really like that dress 
it is making you feel you're pleasing like a to piece my of, eye. Yes, yes. Uh, you are pleasing to my eye, and that plays in to exactly what yeah. women are constantly conscious of that we are meant to be pleasing externally to the people. I have a question mm. because some women do like that. Firstly, how's a man to know if I would, she I likes would it or like not? It. But secondly, Chris talks about slogan T-shirts. He oh. said <laughs> he talks about having that he's had to give up reading statements on T-shirts because he said it became clear that reading the message ran the risk of offending the wearer. And then he says, but I would argue that if you don't like being looked at by strangers in the street, why wear a T-shirt with words on it and invite unwanted stares? Oh, don't start. Well, answer that question. There are parts of this that I really agree with Claire's position and your position about, which is that I think that that is just an extension of an argument that is like, if you don't want to be looked at, why don't you go out with a sack over your head? If you don't want to be looked at, why did you put any makeup on today? Why, If you don't want to be looked at, and I have no time for that because what I believe about this is that women are smart and we have a radar that pings, that tells us, who is genuinely just saying nice shirt. Like if one of the men in our office told me that my dress was nice, it would not bother me even a little bit because I don't think they're coming on to me. I don't think they're trying to belittle me. I think they're just people I know who have eyes and we're all allowed to comment on that stuff. But if a guy in the street is like, if you didn't want me to look at your tits, why did you wear that T-shirt? Then my radar is pinging. You know what I mean? I think we're all clever and I think that the reason why this column if it has inspired any ire is because it's almost like willfully ignoring that fact that he's sort of like can't a man just say a thing and we're all saying but it's never just a man saying a thing yeah but I'm going to argue against that because sometimes it just is you know I don't necessarily agree that there should be a gender divide on whether or not someone can tell me I've got nice shoes or that I look nice today I really don't mind I am conscious of the increasing policing of what you can and can't say. I see articles, you know, as someone who's pregnant, I see TikToks, I see articles that are like all the things not to say to pregnant women. And I'm like, oh, we're policing things to the extent where you just feel bad saying anything about anything. And I agree. And look, if a guy came up to me in the street and said, I really like that dress, I'm not going to berate him. And 99% of women are not going to berate him. And that's why I was a bit frustrated by Christopher's column because I'm like, She's just probably going to think like, ugh, and that's okay. Like you're allowed to say something and somebody is allowed to not receive it in the best way and you can move on. Just like Christopher May, you're allowed to think something about a woman's outfit and not say it. You're actually, that's a thing that can happen. You can think. I've heard I like, that. I like that dress. You can have a thought that and doesn't come out it. of your mouth. Yes. I've heard rumours about this. And I love <laughs> what Kerry Sackville writes, which is if you really want to brighten a woman's day, smile and be polite and respectful. That's what she likes. Give her a smile in the workplace if somebody is like, I want to brighten Claire's day, say hello and ask me how I am. Like a man does not need to comment on what I'm wearing. But I think it's also I about know. I don't what know. Hang you on a value. second. Compliments. Like... You know, if I see someone, like I've become one of those weird people who go, I really like your outfit to people I don't know, like in the supermarket or in the street or whatever. Because I'm also aware, like if I see a particularly an elderly person and I give them a compliment, there's something about being noticed at an age where you feel invisible, which I think Chris is talking about, he's at that age, that is actually very validating. But there's no subtext of exactly. male gaze in that interaction at all. Exactly. And there's more of a connection in it because you're like clearly, no offence, but by looking at you, you're into clothes. And I've seen you do it in public, go up to somebody and say, I really Mm. like that scarf, where'd you get it? And Mm. it's genuine. Because I want it. Connection, exactly, that isn't about objectifying the person. Whereas whenever a man comments on my appearance, I feel objectified. See, I don't agree with that. I agree with 99% of what we're saying and male gaze, of course, but One of my friend's husbands, we went out for fancy dinner, get dressed up. He said, you look great. He was not trying to pick me up. He's not trying to objectify me. He's just giving me a compliment and I liked it. And I put it in my little compliment bank because I'd made a lot of effort to look great. Thank you very much. Actually, yes. If you're going to like a black tie event and you look unlike you've ever looked before and a male friend says, 
you look great. You're like, thank you. I like it when men have to be descriptive about clothes because often they don't have the words. Yeah. So they'll call everything a dress. Yeah. yeah Brent <laughs> That's does a that. lovely dress. And it's like, that's a top. It's a or jumpsuit. A skirt. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us out loud, is, is it ever okay for a man to pay you a compliment? You can leave a voice note, send an email to outloud at mamamia.com.au. Mamma Mia Out Loud! So five of us is $33.50 a piece. No, uh uh-uh, no way. Sorry, not going to happen. How about we'll each, we'll each just pay for what we had, okay? It's, it's no big deal. The most viral article on Mamma Mia this week is one by friend of the podcast, Emily Burnham, who hey. wrote... I expect my rich friends to pay for my half of dinner, and you should too. So, yes, she chose violence this week, and I respect it. She did. She's <laughs> copying it a little she bit. Just, she was like, sometimes I feel like stirring the pot. In it, she tells the story of going to dinner with a much wealthier friend who, when it came time to pay, told the wait staff they'd split the bill. And Em was like, what? No, absolutely not. Em hadn't chosen the restaurant or the fancy bottle of wine, but the biggest part of the equation How was... How much was the bill? It was 400 and something dollars. And the biggest part of the equation was her friend is richer than her, so her friend should pay. Em describes her as the sort of person who's so rich she forgets she's rich and, crucially, she's, I didn't know this was a lot of money rich. So she wouldn't know that the almost $250 she was expecting M to pay was the most M had spent on anything in months. M writes that since then, she's been a big advocate of asking your I didn't know this was a lot of money rich friend to cover your half of the meal if they're not willing to change their lifestyle to suit your needs. Mm-hmm. Mia, mm-hmm. you have more money than me and Holly. And when we go to dinner, mm-hmm. you pay. How do you feel about that Not always, not always. There's a complex dynamic there because Mm. sometimes if I go to dinner with Mia and other grown-up friends, we split. But if we go for dinner with you and Jessie... Who are children. I can't expense it. She pays for the children. (laughs) Oh, can you imagine me splitting a bill with you? Jesus. Um, Before we talk about our particular situations, because the dynamic's interesting and I like that Holly's noticed every time I don't pay for dinner for her. No, I don't. (laughs) <laughs> She's clearly keeping a, a list. I promise she'll I invoice you. She'll invoice you. But I think what's really important to the context for this, because when I read the headline, funnily enough, I got incredibly irritated. Yes. But then I read the piece and M is an Australian woman of South Asian heritage and as part of her story she wrote, I've been raised in a culture where if you were going out to dinner with other people, the bill was like an anti-lottery ticket that every family wanted to take care of. You had to fight for it. I've seen my dad grab another man by the shoulders to push him out of the way so that he could get the bill first and pay for everyone. I've seen children used as distractions so the other family wouldn't see my mum quietly walk up to the front desk and pay for the meal while we were still laughing. Yelling, laughing, phrases like, we'll get you next time, followed when the other family realised what she had done. So I think that's really important. So her cultural upbringing, and I would say mine is similar, is watching that, watching the idea that it was seen as status uh, to to pay the bill. Maybe Mm. status, a mark of generosity, a mark of, I don't know, almost like an etiquette thing, like a funny thing. But you're right. Like I, I remember seeing like dueling credit cards and people doing tricks to pay the bill. And I still see my husband do that all the time. So that's interesting. And My partner's exactly the opposite. <laughs> when the bill comes, I where's know. he gone? Oh, is it the toilet? Oh, I know. <laughs> but it's interesting that yeah. you say that because growing up, that was not my experience. Yeah, like, right. And, and it's only spending time with other people's families that I see that and think, oh, what it, was was your never, it was never a mark of status, as in it was always we'll split it. Yeah. Like it well, because it's not possible for everybody. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I get that. So by the end of reading this article, and please out loud as read it, don't just like crack on in the comments or whatever. We'll link to it in the show notes. I really understood. And I think that when you know that you out earn or out have the money at the table, it feels incredibly petty mm. to just be like, oh, you owe $23 or whatever. So to get rid of any awkwardness, I will often do that. And also when it's in a work situation, I will often do it because, you know, I will. But I've also noticed 
how, and I've had to talk to my husband about this too, that it can be really disempowering for people. It can be really infantilizing isn't quite the right word, but even though it's not done as a power move, or maybe it is, you can take people's power away. Well, this is the thing I was going to say. I think it's more complex because, you know, we were joking before when I said that, you know, when we go out for dinner, sometimes you pay, sometimes you don't. And you were like, I'm glad you were keeping tab. But the truth of that statement is I wouldn't like it if you always paid for dinner because we're friends, right? It depends on the circumstances of who we're with and all those things. Mm. But if we're like a dinner of equals, if you know what I mean, yeah. like that sounds wrong because it makes it sound like that younger colleagues, whatever, aren't equals. It's not that. But like, I think it would be weird if our power dynamic was that you always paid, you know, or that we were in a shop together and you'd be like, let me get that. That would just be weird. So <laughs> yeah. I don't think, I don't think it's that simple. But the thing that's also interesting is that I read this story by M, which is great, as you've said. And I thought, oh shit, I've been for dinner with M. And, <laughs> and I'm older than M and I'm sure I earn more money than M. And we split the bill. <laughs> I'm sure she was like, oh. But then I thought there are times when I go for Maybe brunch. Maybe you were or, the friend in the I article. Know, exactly. I know. That, like there are times when I go for brunch or uh, lunch or whatever with a person who I know is maybe younger and maybe doesn't earn what I earn, but they've got less financial responsibilities than I do. Yeah. So sometimes I'll be like, well, I know I probably should pay for your eggs and coffee and all the things and it's $35, but to be honest, I didn't factor in spending $80 on breakfast today and I've got a mortgage and kids. And, and so it can be like a complicated, and I know that all of this is very privileged because, you know, if you're going out for brunches and lunches and splitting bills and all those things, you've got a certain amount of disposable income. But like, sometimes I'm like, do I have to pay because I probably earn more or do I not have to pay because I've got more things to pay for in my world? That's the awkward thing about this is that you cannot always tell who the rich person is. And you think you can, you think that you go out with a group of people and you're like, oh yeah, so-and-so is a doctor they're set, they've got more money than me, so-and-so is a lawyer. But you actually don't know and you don't know what a person's living situation is like and who's got a mortgage and who's got a baby and all of that. So my brothers in our family, the weirdest dynamic, they always assume that I'm going to pay wherever we go to the movies, to breakfast, to dinner, whatever. They're 30 years old and they (laughs) assume. But they're younger than you, right? So it's the older, younger dynamic. Exactly. So they're like, you're my big sister, you're going to pay. And I'm a little bit like, hold on a second, I have a baby on the way. (laughs) I've had to move to a bigger place. Just in terms of disposable income, you have more than I do. This is really strange. But I, in terms of like a rich person paying when you go to dinner, I have always found it so uncomfortable. I always want to split the bill. The only reason I don't kind of fight when Mia does it is because in my head I tell myself she's going to tax Slam it, it, tax yeah. it, expense it. I She probably doesn't and knowing Mia. Except when you own the business expensing it just to steal <laughs> your money. I know. Exactly. And I refuse to think too hard about that because it gives me anxiety. No, but I'll tell you exactly why I do it because – this is probably too much information for Outlouders, but working with friends is weird and you guys do so much in a work capacity and for me in a work capacity far and above what you're paid for technically. So taking you out to dinner, and I don't even see it as that, but covering the bill is like a drop in the ocean as far as I'm concerned. I prefer to think of the tax write-off okay. element because that <laughs> makes me feel anxious. And when I go to dinner with even I have it with my partner's family who have always been so generous and you go to dinner and they pay, I always feel weird about it and I'm always weird. I'm like, who's paying? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But then it's funny when you're in the situation where you actually couldn't really pay if you wanted to. Like so every now and then I think, Rory, me and you should pay. And then you go to a restaurant and you're kind of with the whole family and you see what the bill is and you're like, oh, mate, even if we wanted to, we couldn't get that. And this is the key to this that's important and Em makes this point, is like the whole argument with her friend is that they're at an expensive restaurant. Dinner for two has cost nearly $500. That is not normal. And if you didn't have any say in that, because if I'm going for dinner with my mates, we probably have different economic realities 
realities. We've got different responsibilities. Some are single families. Some are earning more. Some are earning less. We'll go somewhere really affordable. We'll often choose a BYO. We know that then there's no argy bargy. Like it's just all going to be this much money, and it's not going to strain anybody. But if somebody wants to go somewhere fancy, and often for my birthday I want to go somewhere fancy, then you've got more of a responsibility to go. Well, then. That has to be factored into who's paying. Yes, but even still, I can remember, and I don't know if this is social anxiety or whatever it is, I remember everyone in my life and whether they've paid for a drink for me, a meal for me, and it hangs on me like wow. a sickness. I just, I remember really? we went to brunch the other week and my friend paid and I said, put your bank details in the group and we'll all transfer you, and he hasn't. And I think about it every day. It seems like you don't like owing people. It, that's exactly what yeah. it is. I don't like feeling indebted to people because I don't know what I meant to do to pay them back. Right. If he wanted you to pay him back, he would have put his bank but details what, in the what group about chat. You, the what fact about he hasn't means he doesn't want to. The other thing that I find, particularly you know, you know, when you're an adult and you're both working decent jobs, it can feel really petty to go, let's split the bill if it's like with one close friend, right? So do you ever do that thing like, I'll get it, you get the next one because it's just easier? Yes, but then I have the tab in my head and I've got one friend in particular where I'm like, nah, they've got it so many times Mm. and then I feel sick because he's got two little kids and a mortgage and that kind of thing and it just I would rather go into every situation (laughs) divide it up and then leave and carry none of the guilt. I have one more question before we ask the out louders what they think and that is when you go out to dinner as an adult or have a meal with your parents who pays and when does it (gasps) if it changes when does it change like Holland, Claire, I remember the moment it I used to love it. I used to love it when they would pay for everything and they don't anymore. And sometimes I'll be it because when they come to visit, my parents obviously live in England, if that loud as you don't know. When they come, we'll nearly always go for one posh meal because we are all quite foodie people. We like that. So we'll choose one fancy restaurant for one celebration. And it used to be amazing when they just would pick it up and now they always insist on splitting and I get upset and then I remember that I'm 50 years old. Mamma <laughs> <laughs> Mia out loud. It's time for our best and worst moments of the week. We've had a bit of a talking to ourselves about this segment because it's getting a little bit long, a little bit depressing. So we're going to try to keep it <laughs> bright and breezy. Mm-hmm. Worst things can be quite small. And this week I have quite a small worst thing. Last week Claire's worst thing was climate change. It was too much. This week, that was me. It was like it. Mine is that. I am biting my nails too much, my fingers too much, and they are bleeding and that is always like the canary down the mine shaft of my mental health and my stress levels. And uh, I have started to have to use Stop and Grow. Oh, Oh, I know I'm almost a 52-year-old woman and I'm using Stop and Grow. I reckon mine are worse. That my teenage years. We need to take a photo of our nails and post it to the Outlanders. Look at mine. Mine I think they're worse. I've got bleeding fingers. They're so bad. So that's my worst. My best is that I have been really creatively fulfilled this week. I'm working on a new podcast that I'm certainly not hosting, but I was guest on about fashion. It's called Nothing to Wear. It's launching very soon. And you'll be shocked to know I've been having so much fun with the host, Lee Campbell, and our producer, M, who is also our producer on Out Loud. Because you know, when women say I've got nothing to wear, it means I've got nothing for who I need to be today. So you can have a closet full of clothes but have nothing to wear. So it's going to be all about helping women, you know, enjoy getting dressed again and we've been interviewing experts. And Can I play the trailer? Listen to this. I don't know what to wear. I have nothing. Nothing suitable. I have nothing to wear. Swimmers for my big boobs. A formal wedding in February heat. I just want to be an active wham free mom. Don't judge me, but I'm over it. What even is smart casual in 2023? Okay, what's a capsule wardrobe and do I need it? All these questions answered and more. Nothing to wear. The podcast for your wardrobe. I'm just checking you haven't had me on just because of scheduling. Well, like me, I'll be on. Enough, like me and asked. Holly will be on the podcast yeah. later. A hundred and one ways yeah. with activewear. <laughs> <laughs> My worst is, you know, one of those moments when a mirror is held up to you, you weren't expecting and you're like, oh, 
I'm a punish. <laughs> I really am. This happened to me this week. So Brent and I were getting some extra dog training for Tuna, our dog. She's a very good girl. I don't want anyone to think that she isn't a good girl, but she could do with some improvements. So we've got this dog trainer who came around and he told us we should really work on our voices, the way that we talk to her. So he calls it, when she's done something wrong, he calls it angry dad. So, you know, you go, rrr, 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 voice. And when you want her to come and you're encouraging, he calls it girly voice. Right? And so we had this session and it was fine. And then he leaves and then Brent looks at me and he looks at me like he's a bit worried about something. And I was like, what? And he goes, I knew you wouldn't like that girly voice thing. <laughs> he's like, I knew you'd be offended about it. You're going to talk to me about it for 10 minutes about how he shouldn't call it girly voice. And, <laughs> and, I, and I was like, oh. I hadn't actually thought of that, but that is an insight into what a punish you think I am with my <laughs> feminism and my railing at the patriarchy. And, my, and I was like, babe, I didn't even notice. Girly voice is fine. And he's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> That's so good. Oh, my God. Uh, and my best. It's a very simple, it's a glimmer. You know, we've been talking about glimmers, which are those little things that happen in your day that fill you up. The other day, I was driving Matilda somewhere and on a sort of country-ish road, but a proper like two-lane wide country road. And all the cars came to a stop. And I was annoyed because I was like, I've got to get her to this place at this time. And why are all the cars coming to a stop on this road where there's no traffic? Like I live somewhere, there are no traffic lights. And then what I realized was two lanes of traffic going both ways had stopped to let an echidna cross the road. <gasps> and we That's all beautiful. just watched this because it's sort of echidna season. Aww. City people, you wouldn't know. And they're so, <laughs> they're they're so, so slow. slow. The echidnas are active. And this cute little kid is just, what, just taking its time. It's not bothered about the lines of cars. Everybody's just stopped. No problem. Big tradie guy was the one who got out of his truck and stopped all the cars. The little echidna just toddles across the street, goes off into the scrub, and we all slowly got moving again. And I turned to Matilda and I was like, people are good. And it was just one of those little moments in life Glimmer. where you just like go, that. oh. I love seeing echidnas in the wild. They're very cute, their little feet. My worst of the week is, so out loud is probably know by this point that life admin is mostly my worst. If anybody wanted an update, mm -hmm. I have not got my rug. I think it got returned to the shop because oh, no. I just didn't get it. Anyway, my life admin issue this week is that I tried to do my tax. We're in September. I think that's pretty good effort. Like it actually yeah. hasn't been like a full year. Tried to do my tax can't do my tax because I remembered that a few years ago someone tried to steal my identity and so my number has been compromised and like my MyGov account has been compromised and I've been trying to solve this issue for literal years oh. and I call them and I say excuse me could you unlock my account I am me yeah. I can prove that I'm me Did, and they was say was it Jesse that stole your identity <laughs> <laughs> well apparently <laughs> according to my accountant there are so many Claire Stevenses so that that could also be the issue but I was so annoyed because I was like, I tried to do the thing and now I've got more admin. So when they stole it, did they steal it to like use your credit card or? No, I don't think so. Right. So I don't think so. It just was like a technical. Yes. And maybe it was one of those stolen identity things where like they were trying to get my passport or something yeah, like right. that, like something quite high yeah. level. Maybe I'm part of a bloody program. Maybe I'm a criminal. I don't Do you know. know what? I think pretty soon you'll be selling me. Bitcoin on Instagram. Yeah, oh, don't. If I see your face, I'll let you know. Yeah, that's my like, biggest Brenda's fear. changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> that's my biggest fear that my account's doing that and I don't know. But my best really counteracts it because my best thing of the week is donuts. And during pregnancy, I've had weird cravings for foods I enjoyed as a child. Oh. So like, like, what? like, you know, Tina wafers, like those wafers that are like strawberry, chocolate and vanilla. Yeah, I, I'll have a packet of them and be like, oh, my God, like these make me so happy. And then a few months ago, I discovered like the humble donut that I have forgotten. Like a cinnamon one or an iced no, one? No, uh, actually chocolate. Actually, chocolate, chocolate icing, icing. Oh. yes. With sprinkles? Yes, with sprinkles. As I eat my donuts, 
I shared a, a yeah. thing on Instagram yesterday about how in Uber Eats, my most common search is just donut. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just donut. And it's very sad. But as I eat the donut, I just think this is so clever because it's not cake, but it's a little bit cake. Mm-hmm. And it's chocolate and it's just Everybody needs to just have a donut and I love really donuts. enjoy the experience. But I'm Ice very um, specific. I hate any icing. It's got to just be okay. cinnamon, preferably hot. Donut King oh. cinnamon donuts are elite. There isn't a Donut King near me, and that has become an issue. <laughs> I've got a recommendation before we go, but I'm sure it's actually from all of us because I know we have all read this book. But I was lucky enough to read it when I was on holiday in Malaysia earlier this year. I literally couldn't put it down. It's Sally Hepworth's new book, Darling Girls. It came out this week. Now, I know all the out louders are savvy and they know that Sal is a friend of the show. In fact, if you follow me on Instagram, you would know that yesterday she was over at Mia's house helping you, Grandma. Is that right, Mia? It was. We are recording this show early today because I'm going and doing a bit of an in-conversation with Sal at Dimmicks about her book. But I have to tell you that that is not why we're recommending it because this was so good. Her books are good, right? But I think this one is one of her absolute best. One of the reasons for it is particularly the first half of this book is really creepy. It's about these three women who, when they were young girls, were fostered by this rather mysterious woman in this mysterious house. And it sort of follows their various memories and and what had happened and a mystery that has unfolded and brought them all together in adulthood. It is so good and it is so creepy and it is so page turny. I loved it. Mia, you don't like suspense, but I bet you liked it too. Yeah, the characters were just so compelling, super, super quick pacey plot turner loved it sally's books Page turner. are ones that i love because i read in like a day or two because i can't put them down and the twist at the end of this mm. book she just pulls it off every bloody time Out loud as so she's good. not a new york times best-selling author for nothing no. the lady knows her stuff yeah she is so it's called darling girls it's in all good bookshops now and of course remember out loud as if you're a subscriber you get a discount at booktopia so go buy sally's book If you're looking for something else to listen to right now, because you're not going to hear us on Monday, it's a long weekend. On yesterday's subscriber episode, we talked about the new doco series called The Supermodels and Holly and I schooled one Claire Stevens on what a supermodel was. And just a little spoiler alert, when she tried to say, I've watched Australia's next top model, I I know models, oh, (laughs) <laughs> Some glances were thrown. <laughs> anyway, we had a lot to say and we'll put a link to that episode in the show notes. Thank you for listening to Australia's number one news and pop culture show. The episode is produced by Emmeline Kazillas. The assistant producer is Tali Blackman with audio production by Madeline Juanu. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.